All right, guys, welcome back. This is module five, lesson four. We just wrapped up lesson three, which was all about the non-invasive respiratory devices. And now we are transitioning into lesson four, which is on the mechanical ventilator. Now this is an invasive respiratory intervention. And so we will now proceed. Okay, so the purpose of this lesson is to tell you guys about when to, you know, talk about how it's invasive, tell you guys how, when to initiate it, talk about the, the, talk about the patient vent system, go through the ventilator settings and parameters, talk about the ventilator modes, SIMV, pressure support, CPAP and PEEP. Uh, so, so we will talk about uh, those two concepts, which are CPAP and PEEP. We will then move into talking about the complications of, of mechanical ventilation, talking about how to wean someone from mechanical ventilation, and then talk about general principles of ventilator management. So what I'm gonna show you guys next is a recording I did on a Facebook Live a few months ago. And I really think that it did a really good job at summarizing all of this information. And if there's something more or a deeper dive into any piece of this information, or if you want further ventilator modes, just feel free to let me know. I would be more than happy to put up any kind of ventilator mode, but I just wanted to make sure I was at least, at least touching base on the most common things that you will be seeing, at least in the beginning. And then as we progress through this course, if something comes up, shoot me a message, uh, post a question on the Facebook group, and I would be, and I would be more than happy to add to this particular lesson for you guys. The most important thing for this is to focus on the absolute basic foundations and then to build upon your foundations. And so we just want to talk about first that, so mechanical ventilation, so there's a million different ways to, de to deliver O2. Um, and there's, you have your invasive ways and you have your non-invasive ways. Well, mechanical ventilation is definitely invasive. So, you know, you, you either have like the ETT tube that goes all the way down your throat into your trachea or you have your tracheostomy there. So that's just a couple a couple things to keep in mind. So mechanical ventilation is definitely invasive. You know, and so there's there's many different indications for mechanical ventilation. So after all the methods of non-invasive ventilation are like exacerbated, you know, so if you've used your CPAP and BiPAP and everything to its max capacity and you're like at 100% FI, FiO2 on the BiPAP and on your heated high flow, you know, it's probably time to start thinking about mechanical or mechanical ventilation. So you just, you know, so, you know, there's different, so other indications include apnea, um, inadequate alveolar ventilation, hypoxemia, you know, just impending ventilator failure, you know, your lungs can't quite expand enough, um, or the muscles are just that weak. So then, you really need to be aware that, you know, it's it's a lot easier to intubate preemptively than too late. So you really want to be on the phone with your critical care physician and your respiratory therapist, just kind of give them a heads up, you know, saying, hey, I think this patient is feeling tuckered out. And you'll notice that because if they were at one point fighting the BiPAP, then you know, you'll know they're actually getting tuckered out when when they aren't fighting the, the BiPAP whatsoever. So they go from being, oh, get this thing off of me to, you know, they're not really doing too much and they're probably neurologically decompensated as well. So then you need to consider intubating. Um, so many, uh, I, I believe almost every single hospital across the United States has something called um, rapid sequence intubation. So basically it's a protocol where you rapidly <laughs> intubate your patient and there's a certain sequence of events and pharmacological interventions that have to take place in order for it to be successful in order to, in order for it to go very fast and very well. So, um, so most ICUs have RSI kits. There's usually a warm one and a cold one. So when I say warm and cold, um, usually, you know, if you have an acidose or a McKesson, the warm one is not in the refrigerated area and the cold one is actually in the refrigerated area. And don't forget to grab both. So when someone says, hey, I need you to grab the RSI kit, you grab both the warm and the cold, but always, you know, just check with what your facility asks you to actually do. So then after you grab your RSI kit, um, the physician is going to ask you to draw up certain medications. So you have your analgesics and then you have your paralytics. So 
Every single physician is going to want something different unless your area has a specific protocol of what you follow. But you definitely want to be giving your analgesics and your amnesics before you give your par before you give the paralytic. And so just remember that. So I'll go into detail upon this in another vid, you know, in another video here, but you need to remember to give those before the paralytic. <laughs> Because you definitely don't want to paralyze your patient before you know they are, you know, uh, comfortable. Because you you never want an awake patient on a paralytic. Very dangerous. Very scary. I mean, I'm sure that's, I know that's one of my worst fears. So, moving on from there. So, let's just talk about the patient vent system. So, you have the ICU patient. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Allie. Yeah, definitely would not want, you want to be paralyzed first. Exactly. So, the patient... Uh, ET tube, trach, however that vent is going into that person, and the vent is a closed circuit. So the ventilator um, obviously does the breathing for the patient, and there's many different settings that you can go into, um, but but there's two different types of, uh, or the two, <laughs> there, there's inspiratory track and expiratory track for your circuits. So obviously one tube is going into the patient, one tube is going out, and they're obviously connected at that uh, endotracheal tube or after tracheostomy. So uh, it's really important to know the importance of your inspiratory um, circuit and your inspiratory tubing because in there you can have appropriate humidity and then you can have any any kind of um, treatments, you know, that's your uh, nebulizers, your meter dulced inhalers can go into there because there's certain uh, and special adapters. And then we can get into something called bleachery, which for the cardiac world um, has many different things, but uh, most importantly, um, offloads the right side of the heart by uh, taking care of the lungs. But again, we'll go into that in a different video. So there's so there's lots of diff different settings, again, and different parameters. I'm not sure if you can see this board or if it's flipped backwards because everything on Instagram always seems to mirror, but I can take this down at the end of the video here and kind of look at this. So on your main um, mechanical ventilation screen, you are always going to have, or at least the ones in our facility have three separate waveforms here. The mode is up at, at the top. You have your FiO2, your PEEP, um, your respiratory rate, and then your tidal volume. So those are probably the most important things you want to go ahead and just start to remember right off the, the bat, especially if you're very new. Those are always the most important things you need to know. Um, so moving forward, I'll pull that up again at the end, but I can actually flip the camera so you can actually see it. So uh, there's there's lots of different modes. Um, so I'm not going to dive too much into these, but as far as the modes you want to be aware of, so there's modes where the vent is doing all of the work, and there's vent and there's modes where the vent isn't doing as much of work, but it's allowing the patient to do do something that we call call weaning. So common uh, ventilator modes within our facility include SIMV, or that synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. We also have something called PRVC, and that to us is something called pressure regulated volume control. And then we have PS, which is pressure support, CPAP, um, which is you know continuous positive airway pressure. And if you weren't in the ICU prior to um, hearing, uh, you know, hearing about this, your your CPAP mode is very common. Um, in, you know, in any normal CPAPs um, that you have on the regular floors. Um, so yeah, so let's just kind of talk about that or those of, uh, a little bit. So SIMV, again, so this is a vent setting with, that actually delivers a specific number of breaths um, of a particular volume every single minute. Um, then when you go into pressure support, so this is, again, so this is a spontaneous breathing setting. And so usually when your patients are weaning or these hours are in our specific ICU, we have something called CPAPs. So when you look up on your screen here, on your ventilator up at the top, it's going to say PS slash CPAP or CPAP slash uh, PS. So pressure support CPAP. So what that means is that the patient is currently weaning and it's usually, again, used in conjunction with the CPAP mode. And think of um, you know, think of pressure support as the higher the pressure support, the higher amount of O2 that is actually being delivered to the patient. 
Um, just because it, it allows the patient to breathe past the extra resistance of the endotracheal tube and the tracheostomy tube, because because those, those tubes are so low, it adds extra resistance that, that, that the patient has to try to breathe through, and it's definitely not comfortable. Um, we usually say it's like breathing through a straw, so if you can imagine trying to breathe through a straw to take big, normal breaths when you're trying to wean after you've been on a vent for a while, it is a little bit scary. So um, let's see here. So going on, uh, so talking about CPAP and concept of PEEP. So again, so CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. And again, you are probably all familiar with, with that. But PEEP, um, you know, another important mode. So if there's two things you're gonna take away from this video, I want you guys to remember what your FiO2 is and your PEEP is. But right now we're focusing on PEEP. So. PEEP is a very important setting on your, on your mechanical ventilator, stands for positive um, and expiratory pressure. And so normal physiological PEEP is anywhere from three to five, but typically we want it to be five in the ICU. So five is usually our base, you know, and again, if you're from a, di a different area, like you do whatever is on your, your protocol, but ours, and typically it's usually five. Um, so you want to aim for PEEP of five. So depending on the patient's needs, so, so the PEEP is, is there to help recruit more of the alveoli. So again, it's extra pressure. So the increase in positive and expiratory pressure, you know, it allows for those alveoli to be more open and it really does help to promote alveo uh, al so bleh, excuse me, alveolar recruitment and lung compliance. So, you know, and this is very important for patients who have something called ARDS. Um, and again, we will touch on this and so many other things in the IC orientation course that I'm launching in February. But one of the most essential PEEP points is that the patient should only be getting as much PEEP um, that is actually required to improve their, or to improve their condition physiologically. You know, you don't want too much PEEP because that can cause trauma. And that's another thing that you're gonna be looking for again um, on your ventilator screen. Over here, you will have a whole bunch of, of other things, uh, you know, alarms, but, um, particularly your P peak or your pressure peak is something you want to keep an eye on and you want to make sure that's not going up too high because that can cause something called barrel trauma or volume trauma depending on the source. So we should really again be aiming to keep the 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 peep just where it has to be in order to improve that patient's current condition. And so again, so you really don't want, so like when you're looking at peak pressures, you really don't want to, to see them anywhere above 40. Um, some places have a lower tolerance, but you de definitely want to, to keep them at least in the low 30s. When you start to see them barking on that vent around 40, like that's usually, <laughs> usually an indicator that something has to be adjusted or there's something wrong with, with the tube or they're biting on things or something along those lines. So when we're, so then when you think about so there's a difference between vents. So when, when you think of the normal uh, pressure in the chest, you have normal physiological pressures inside and, and, and outside. So the chest is a negative pressure system. So when you look at, or when you think about, you know, those old time vents, you know, those iron lungs, I don't know if you guys ever have heard of those things, but um, so, so those iron lungs were negative pressure systems where most vents, like I'm, I'm like probably ninety per percent of vents nowadays, are positive pressure vents, and so 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 this is great. So it's giving pressure and changing pressures, but of course that will mean that that you are switching the physiological differences of the pressures from inspiration to expiration. So usually when one you know when you're inspirating or so so just so just think your pressures are flipped we'll go into more detail later but that's probably the only thing you need to know um for this next point so normal physiological breathing uh, like it so normal physiological breathing does not decrease your venous return but when you flip your pressures around and you create this uh or when you change and add pressure into your into thoracic cavity it will decrease the amount of blood flow coming back into your heart. And so you're definitely going to see decreased uh, blood return or, or decreased venous blood return or preload um, and reduced cardiac output. And if you are a CVICU nurse or a CICU nurse, you know, this is very, very important because the higher your PEEP is, the higher chance of this is actually, you know, the higher chance that this is actually going to happen. So you definitely need to keep an eye on that. 
it's very important to know if you're if you're working against your vent or if your vent is working for you. So you need to know the difference. So PEEP, you know, can also increase ICP and decrease renal perfusion. And unfortunately, it can also worsen intracardiac shunts. So aside from that, there are obviously other uh, complications of mechanical ventilation. So Again, we just talked about the hemodynamic compromise. So the hemodynamic compromise, again, is because of PEEP. So when you have too much PEEP, it changes the pressures that you normally have in your chest, which leads to decreased venous return to the heart and therefore decreased cardiac out out output because it is affecting your preload. You know, so one way to improve this, you know, if it's appropriate for your patient is to make, is to make sure that, you know, you optimize their, their preload by assessing their CBP or something along those lines in order to look at their blood volume and their fluid volume to make sure it's appropriate. But again, just make sure optimizing their preload is appropriate for that particular patient. And then the other complication of, me of mechanical ventilation that you are really gonna wanna keep an eye out for is something called barrel trauma or volume trauma. So again, so this occurs when the alveoli are stretched and and, and they just get over distended from the actual PEEP or from the volume that the uh, vent is giving you. And then the third thing I want to talk about is something called auto PEEP. And so auto PEEP is also known as like, I don't know, have you, have you, I don't know you've probably heard of like gas trapping or, or air trapping, but you know, it occurs when the, the next inspiration given by the vent is delivered before the exhalation can actually be completed. And so then this leads to high and dangerous pressures in the lungs. So you definitely don't want the patient stacking breaths. You definitely want them to be able to get rid of that full inspiration before that next in exhalation. I mean, sorry, <laughs> you want to get rid of the full exhalation before the inspiration is actually given. Otherwise, it's going to be dangerous. Another complication of mechanical ventilation is something called a ventilator associated pneumonia or VAP. Um, so this is usually, you know, it's from colonized bacteria in your mouth and then that <clears throat> does go down into your, your lungs. And so usually you'll find these patients have many, many, many different things to prevent this from happening. You know, you're going to do your oral cares every two hours. You're going to do your subglottal suctioning, which, you know, it, if, if you do it right, it's very gross. So <laughs> you'll know you're doing it right when you get a whole bunch of stuff up. So, um... Uh, and then there's other uh, preventions or something called, you know, you know, so when you have an upper GI hemorrhage with, with mechanical ventilation, you know, th this is secondary to the gastric ulcers uh, re related to stress ulcers. And usually your patients will be on something, you know, some kind of PPI or something along those lines for stress ulcer prophylaxis. And so then the next most important topic um, is something called weaning. And so weaning is when our patients are finally doing better and we can actually start to work them off of the mechanical ventilator. Um, our, for cardiothoracic surgery patients or open heart sur surgery patients, we have something called a fast track extubation protocol. And this allows the nurses to have autonomy of decreasing the FiO2, working re with respiratory therapy and getting these patients uh, extubated within six hours after arrival to our ICU. But just focusing on main patients, um, so when you're focusing on weaning, there's different uh, modes and methods of weaning. So you can wean by T-piece, blow by, or tray collar um, when you're like not on the vent. So so think so you can think of those. You know you can be on the vent, but you know usually the patient is removed from the vent and then they're connected to an oxygen source with that uh, T-piece. So I didn't hear about a T-piece until maybe, gosh, I think a year into my ICU experience. And then trach collar dome. So again, so this is uh, when you have a patient who has an actual trach, and then you have a dome, um, and that and that dome sits right across there and has an elastic uh, strap and snaps, and then it gets hooked up to either again the vent or the wall for for some kind of oxygen delivery, and you can have humidity or, or not. But this is just an overview. Um, and then CPAP mode is also a very 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 common weaning mode that we do do in the ICU. And so CPAP, so usually we do CPAP with pressure so support. So again, it's usually not used alone when we're weaning patients who are on the vent, but this mode, you know, the patient is obviously still on the vent. 
and um, again, so pressure support, it definitely will allow the patient to initiate their, their own breath, but pressure so support, you're, you're thinking, they, we are giving them extra pressure in order to blow past the extra resistance of that little itty bitty tiny endotracheal tube, because it, it is pretty narrow. So then for ventilator management, we really need to make sure one of the most important things is that that we are assessing for and making sure patients are doing is that our patient is actually synced with the vent. And so you want to, you know, you walk into your patient room, you want to make sure that <laughs> that your endotracheal tube is actually in, in, in your patient and that they are appropriately uh, restrained to the, the bed so that they can't reach it. Um, but you definitely want to make sure they are in sync. So you will hear something called, oh, this patient has a uh, ventilator or, or, or they're asynchronous on the vent or they're synchronous on the vent. So you want your patient to be synchronous. So you want them to, to be, to, you want them to be breathing with the vent, not against it. So this is again, is super, super, super important because you definitely don't want your patient bucking on the vent and you are going to hear it. Like you, you're going to hear this gosh darn, <laughs> You're gonna, you're gonna hear your vent just go off and off and off and off and off. So just make sure that your patient is, is synchronized. So in order to make sure they are synchronized, you need to make sure that their sedation is optimized, you know, and you'll actually probably be pretty surprised at the level of sedation it takes some patients to actually be synchronized with the vent. And so again, bolus your patient per your orders. Go up on your sedation medications per your orders and just make sure you're really optimizing their actual RAS score in order to optimize their sedation. If you don't have, have enough, go ahead and talk to the physicians and get better sedation. And then, you know, when they still remain asynchronous, uh, you've, you've probably heard of patients who are paralyzed on the vent and paralyzing your patient is usually a last resort to get uh, ventilated or synchrony. But just be aware if you, if you just can't get your patient to sync up well that that's probably what you're going to end up doing um so yeah so aside from that we need to also make make sure obviously that we are maintaining a patent airway or patent air airway however you like to, to say it no judgment so we need to make sure we are keeping that endotracheal keeping that endotracheal tube nice and clear so you are suctioning when it's necessary. So we aren't going to be suctioning, you know, every five, five minutes. But if you see your SATs drop, you're going to suction. If you hear anything in that tube, you want to make sure you suction because that tube again is so narrow. Any extra junk in that tube is going to affect their ability to clear that or to breathe. And you definitely don't want any other impedance occurring from them getting good oxy oxy oxygenation. That's a hard word to say at this time of night. So other things you can do, so again, so you have your endotracheal tube and then there's this usually like, it's, a, it's a, like an inner cannula and you kind of shoot it right down and you just suction on it on the way up. And it, again, if you're doing it right, there's lots of stuff, it is pretty gross. So um, you also need to make sure that, that, that you are listening and visualizing your patient's chest. You know, you want to make sure both sides of their chest are rising and falling on inspiration and on expiration. And then you need to be listening for any kind of adventitious breath sounds. You want to, you know, if they're wheezy, get them the PRN neb. Um, or, you know, if there's crackles or, or anything, just use your assessment to guide whatever interventions your patient needs at that, at, at that particular time. So you really want to ensure you know optimal humidity too. Um, so usually, at least in our facility, our respiratory therapists manage that. However, we do have a little canister. I don't know about yay size. Sorry, <laughs> it's just my IT. So it's usually you know probably about this size, and they're usually on the CPAP machines too for patients who have sleep apnea. But just, but just make sure it's full enough. And I'm just gonna take a sip. But make sure it's full so it's not dry because you don't want dry air going to your patient who has a ton of mucus. Because what is that going to do? It's going to dry it up and then you're going to mucus plug and then your intense business is going to have to bronk your patient at three o'clock in the morning and you won't be happy. So, so anyways. Um, so another thing you need to make sure your patient isn't biting off their own airway. And so what can happen, again, I don't put this in, in my mouth, but the patient 
right? So the endotracheal tube is down your patient's throat and mouth, but it's also in between their teeth. And so sometimes you'll you'll hear your vent alarming and going off and you find out, oh, hey, guess what? My patient isn't getting any oxygen and my oxygen, I, 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 my sat is in the 70s or is in the 70s and holy crap, my patient is biting their tube in half and we aren't getting any air to them and we need to do some something about this quick. Um, so that usually means, especially if they're awake and if they're kind of um, fighting you, you'll probably have to grab a partner or your respiratory therapist and put in this little plastic piece uh, in our facility. It's usually around this color, around, around this size, right? Um, and that goes around the tube and it prevents the patient from biting down onto that tube because, you know, we definitely want to make sure our patients have enough air or are or, or actually getting the air that we are delivering to them um, to make sure that they don't go into a respiratory rest. That would not be good. So aside from that, um, we just, you know, so we can do many, many, many things in order to monitor our oxygenation and to optimize our patients on the vent. Um, so anytime, so again, when you're first starting out, vents are kind of, are very daunting. You always have this full screen. you got waveforms going everywhere. You, this thing makes a whole bunch of sound all the time, especially when the patient coughs. Um, but then just moving down here, sorry, I have to back up so I can have this in the screen. Um, so just talking about FiO2. So this is the percent of oxygen you are delivering to your patients. Um, so the vent can go from 21 to 100. So we usually start, um, sorry, excuse me. So we usually have our patients, uh, I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen below 25% on the vent, but um, we, so the air you and I breathe is anywhere from like 20 to 21 to 22% oxygen. So anything above that is extra that, that the vent is going at. Is going ahead and delivering. This is this is that special number here called PEEP and PEEP is what? What guys? Yes it's positive and expiratory pressure right there again so normal physiological pressure is what? Does anyone remember? Five? Sweet okay five yes um, and again so I, I do know there's huge ranges on the bottom of most of these vents but just know what is normal. Normal is probably five. Uh, ARDS patients, you're looking at eight, maybe up to 10. And the highest I think I've seen yet is 10 or 12. Um, I, I, I probably had one higher number, but it was on a larger patient. So I'll just, I'll just start there. Um, and then of course, here's your respiration rate, because when you have higher respirations or lower respirations, you're able to either blow off more or less CO2. And that affects what? Your pH, yes, awesome. So you are able to affect your pH by using your vent, by using your actual rate here, and by looking at, at your AVGs in order to either drive more CO2 up or retain more CO2. Again, and that just depends what you need per the ABG. So, so, so if you don't know, get a baseline ABG. If you just made a ventilation or, or change in your FI, O2, usually wait 15 minutes before sending another ABG to just allow that um, amount of oxygen to kind of settle into the patient. And then this over here is your volume or your tidal volume or the amount that, that your patient is breathing. And, th and this is really important, specifically when you're talking about weaning. So you don't want your, pa you know, you obviously don't want your respiration rate to be somewhere, you know, in like the you know, four range or three range. Um, and you definitely want them to be taking big enough breaths. Uh, you, don't, you don't want like baby breaths, like 100 to like 150, you know, maybe 200. You know, you want normal average breaths, like three, 400, four, 450 um, breaths uh, being put out of those patients.